In this video, we're going to look at the Chomsky hierarchy of languages. We're also going to define context-sensitive languages and look at an example. Context-sensitive languages are more powerful than context-free languages, and uh, so we'll see an example of something that is not context-free. Some languages are not context-free. Here's an example. It's sort of the canonical example of a language that's not context-free. 0 to the n, 1 to the n, 0 to the n. Here's an example string. We've got five zeros, five ones, followed by five zeros. This language is simple. Okay, it's not hard to understand what's in this language, but it is not a context-free language. Okay, we cannot find a context-free grammar to describe this thing. It's easy enough to write a program to recognize strings in this language. It's decidable whether you can recognize the strings in this language. It's a simple language, really. Conceptually, it's simple, but it's also not context-free. We uh, will show elsewhere how to use the pumping lemma to prove that this is not a context-free language. So what we want to talk about here is the different kinds of languages. And Noam Chomsky, uh, a famous uh, uh, philosopher and linguist, um, has come up with uh, a, a hierarchy of different languages or a classification of languages that uh, you need to know about. You need to know this terminology. We talk about regular languages and context-free languages, and we use the term recursively enumerable. But the Chomsky hierarchy talks about type 3, type 2, type 1, and type 0 languages. So type 3 languages are regular languages. Type 2 languages, those are the context-free languages. And then we have type 1 languages, and these are context-sensitive languages. And finally, we have type 0 languages. So with a context-free grammar, we have grammar rules that have terminals and non-terminals. But every rule takes the form of a non-terminal on the left-hand side, and on the right-hand side, a string of terminals and non-terminals, perhaps epsilon, Perhaps it's only terminals, perhaps it's only non-terminals, but the key thing is that on the left-hand side, there's only a single symbol, and that symbol is a non-terminal. In general, we can talk about context-sensitive grammars, and those grammar rules allow something slightly different. Okay? Again, you have a single non-terminal on the left-hand side, symbolized by A here, being changed into something else, symbolized by gamma here. Gamma is a string of terminals and non-terminals, just like with a context-free rule. However, what's different is you can have context around the A. So in other words, we only apply this rule in certain situations, when A is preceded by alpha and followed by beta. Okay, we don't change the context. We only change A by substituting gamma for A. Alpha and beta are, in general, uh, strings of terminals and non-terminals. They may or may not be present, maybe, uh, maybe epsilon in some rules, but if the grammar contains something besides a simple non-terminal on the left-hand side, then it's no longer context-free. We'll have an example of a context-sensitive grammar uh, coming up. Type 0 languages are what we call recursively enumerable languages. And another term, other words we use for these are Turing enumerable or Turing recognizable. But I stick with the terminology recursively enumerable. And here's a grammar rule in a language that's type 0. And here we see a left-hand side and a right-hand side. And this is a rewrite rule of some sort. This is a pattern, and this is what it's replaced by. But notice that in the context-sensitive version, we had a single non-terminal replaced by something within a context. Here, we have several symbols being replaced, and uh, uh, we can't say that A is replaced by uh, that B is replaced by something because the context Y is also changed. So, B X is changed to D E Y in the context that is preceded by A. Here, we have more going on. Okay, and this is the type 0 languages that give us uh, essentially Turing power. Here's the example language we're going to look at. This is not a context-free language. 
It is a context-sensitive language, and we're going to design a context-sensitive grammar to recognize strings in this language. The language consists of ones, twos, and threes, where we have the same number of ones followed by the same number of twos followed by the same number of threes. One to the n, two to the n, three to the n, where n is greater than or equal to one. So here's the approach we're going to take to design our grammar. We're going to start with a start symbol, and in a derivation, uh, we'll end up with a sentential form like this. A bunch of A's followed by a bunch of B's followed by a bunch of C's. And then we'll turn the A's into 1's, the B's will each turn into 2's, and each of the C's will turn into a 3. Okay? Each A will turn into a 1, each B will turn into a 2, and each C will turn into a 3. In fact, uh, we can dispense with the A's altogether. Our string, uh, our sentential form here won't even have A's. We'll just go straight to 1's. So it'll actually look like this, 1, 1, 1, B, 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 C, C, C. We'll never actually use A. And here we have the same number of 1's, the same number of B's, and the name, same number of C's. And then when we're done, when we get to this point, we're pretty much done. All we do is convert the um, B's to 2's and the C's to 3's. Okay, so here are the rules that we're going to use to convert the B's to a 2. Notice, these are context, notice that these are context-sensitive rules. B, when it's preceded by a 1, will be turned into a 2. The context stays the same. B, when it's preceded by a 2, will be turned into a 2. So B's are turned into 2's, and then in these rules, C's are turned into 3's. Okay? The C can be, be preceded by a 2 or a 3. So here's an example using these rules. The first rule is applied to turn 1B into, a, into 1, 2, so the 2, B is, turns into a 2, and then we use the second rule to change this B into a 2, and then we use it again to change this B into a 2, and now we have the pattern 2C, and we use the third rule to change that C into a 3, and then we have the pattern 3C, and we use the last rule to change the C's into 3's, ending with the desired string. Notice that we can never reduce a CB. Okay? If we end up with a sentential form of CB, it can never be reduced. Okay? C's can only turn into 3's, and if we turned a C into a 3, we would have the pattern 3B. Okay? And it could not be reduced any further. So we couldn't get a string of terminals. So if we apply a rule that turns that creates a CB uh, pattern, and then we apply uh, the rule that turns that C into a three, we would never get a string of terminals. Okay, so we can't do that. Three B would never be reducible. So the, in order for these rules to work, the Bs have to precede the Cs. Okay, now let's look at some other rules. Here. Are, is the main rule that generates the right number of B's, C's, and 1's. Okay, so the first rule is uh, going to be used over and over to generate all of our 1's, our B's, and our C's. And notice for every 1 that's generated, we generate a B and a C. This rule keeps the number of B's, C's, and 1's equal. So we, uh, it, just, it just doesn't put them in the right order. Okay. So we get a string, this rule will give us a string like this, 1, 1, 1, 1, B, C, B, C, B, C, B, C. Okay? The, we have the right number of B's and C's, just not the right order. Here is a parse tree for a similar string showing how that might work. S reduces to 1, B, C, with an S in the middle. That reduces to 1, S, B, C. That reduces to 1, S, B, C. I didn't show the S here, and then the S reduces to epsilon. So this gives us 1, 1, 1, B, C, B, C, B, C. So we've got the right number of 1's, the correct number of B's, and the correct number of C's. Step 2 is to get the B's in front of the C's. So here's a rule that does that. Change a CB into a BC, and that basically will move all of the B's to the left. And then finally, in the last step, 
we use the rules that we showed on the previous slide to reduce the B's to 2 and the C's to 3. Okay, those are the rules that were shown above. But wait a minute. Take a look at this. The rule right here is not a context-sensitive rule. Okay? You can't say that we're changing the C the, into something, into a B. The con you can't say which non-terminal is being changed into something and, and which is the context. So this is actually not a context-sensitive rule. Okay? This is a, a rule from type 0 languages, and it's not allowed. So we haven't finished our task yet. We haven't gotten a context-free, uh, sorry, we haven't gotten a context-sensitive grammar yet. So here's the final solution. Here's the context-sensitive grammar for our language. Okay, and let's walk through it. Here we have our first rule, which generates the right number of 1's, B's, and C's. Okay, down here we have the rules that change B into 2, as long as the B is preceded by a 1 or a 2, and that change the C into a 3, as long as the C is preceded by a 2 or a 3. And here you have the rules that reverse the B and C, that swap the CB and turn it into BC. Okay, and these are context sensitive. So look what happens here. C is the non-terminal that's being changed to an H. We're introducing a new non-terminal here, H. The context is B. Here, we're changing a B into a C, and the context is the H. The H stays the same. And finally, we're changing the H into a B, and the context is C, so H is cha being changed into a B. And you can see that we can apply these rules to turn CB into BC. So this, then, is our context-sensitive grammar example. This, grammar, this language is not context-free, it's context-sensitive, and here's a context-sensitive grammar to describe it.